time. Category should be big or small or what. Okay. So um, I'm going to also talk about ensembles. When we see a bunch of things, a bunch of circles of different sizes, a bunch of faces of different happiness, a bunch of whatever, we know the mean uh, and the range of that set of objects. And there too, we're going to have the same paradox, which is that what do we include in the ensemble? They have to be similar enough to be part of the ensemble. At the same time, they have to be different. Otherwise, we would have an ensemble of one. Uh, let, let's try an experiment with categorization. I'm going to show you some pictures. Scream out the name of the picture, uh, preferably in your mother tongue, because it works best in your mother tongue. Okay, whatever it happens to be. Okay, ready, set, go. <laughs> Okay, very good. Okay. So, three conclusions from the demonstration. Okay. Number one, you have no difficulty in immediately naming the object. Naming what? Naming the category. Second, there's generally agreement, well, different languages, but agreement of the name which you give. And the level that you give for the category. You say apple, kapua, rather than Macintosh, or rather than fruit, okay, or food. You say tree, not oak, not a plant, not a living thing. So the level of category that you give is what we call the basic level. And there's general agreement that that's the first thing that people give. Now, categories are often defined by the traits that they have. Their size, their color, uh, their use, what we do with them. Happy birthday. Uh, uh, like I needed that. <laughs> you needed that, yes. <laughs> okay, and the validity of a cube is uh, how many other members of the category will have uh, that cube. And what, to what extent, uh, and how many members of other categories have that cube? 
So the more that other categories have that same size, for example, the less size will be an important category. The less members of the same category have that size, the, uh, the worse is the category. Okay? Listen. Okay. So, and we said there are three levels of categorization. Uh, basic level, which is the one usually given, the one that you gave most often, it's most inclusive where their attributes are common to all or most of the members of the category. Total Q validity is maximized. <coughs> subordinate level, uh, subordinate level, furniture instead of chair, vehicle instead of car, are more abstract with members that share fewer uh, attributes. Okay, subordinate categories have a lower total Q validity <laughs> and subordinate categories, chicken, kitchen chair, sports car, are more specific with fewer members. They bundle predictable attributes better, but uh, kitchen chair shares attributes with other chairs, and so forth. Okay, uh, and, and w when I taught this in the course last week, somebody said, well, wait, wait, why do you have three levels? Maybe there should be five levels or, or 10 levels. Who's it? Yes, it's arbitrary to call it three levels. This is work done 50 years ago, and uh, today we might say, well, there may be more levels. Okay, accept it. Classical theory uh, goes according to the rule-based uh, uh, theories, uh, where what's important is the traits which are shared by the category. Prototype theory says that the best example of a category may be the average of things. That's the important one. That defines the category. And in general, classical theory, any objects that belong to the category, if it shares most of its, well, it doesn't have to share all of them. We have family resemblance, good enough. Exemplar theory says stores many examples. We don't share, store <coughs> only the prototype, we store many. And boundary theory says we're going to have boundaries between the categories. I'm not going to go all into all of this, because you all know this probably, but I bring it up because I want to use some of it for some of the things that we've done. And uh, the first question is, can we categorize without any supervision? Nobody ever told us. Uh, you know, usually parents tell their kids, you know, this is a dog and this is a cat, and, and okay, and, and so on. But what about without any supervision? Do how do we categorize the world? Anyways, so we did this following experiment quite some time ago. This picture didn't come out very well. <laughs> okay, so what the subject saw were two lines, and the width of the lines could be wide or narrow. That's all. Okay, and they were asked to categorize it. But uh, what they didn't know was, and they didn't know it even after they did the experiment four times, uh, was that the frequency with which these lines appeared, uh, the thin ones would appear uh, equally, and then this size would appear more often, and then this size less often, and this size more often, and this size less often. So there was a frequency of appearance in the testing was either with three peaks or four peaks or uniform across them. And we wanted to see how they were categorized. And what happened was that they categorized the three peak one. They put the middle of their category. They, they had 10 keys, and they had to get one of the 10 keys to categorize the, uh, the, the stimuli. They put the center really near the three peaks, and the boundaries between them more often between them. Uh, and the uniform was a mess, four peaks with four peaks. Uh, and we can see session one, two, three, four, the center was getting more and more of the peak, the boundaries also going the sides, not in the middle, and the same for the four peaks. And uh, three peaks was a bit faster than four peaks. Uh, maybe here you can already see it. What were the exact question with the boundaries? The question to the subject was nothing. What? This, all the subject had to do was, you see this picture, give it a number one to 10. That's all they have to do. And then we look what numbers they gave and where they put. Okay. okay. So unsupervised classification, you can classify things without any real, nobody told them what to do, nobody, okay? and yet they were categorized. Okay. Now, what about supervision? What kind of supervision? When we tell a child this is a dog, what are we saying to them? We're giving a name. Okay. But we're doing two things. We're saying that this is a dog and this is a dog means they're similar. 
and we say this is a dog and this is a cat, we say they're dissimilar. Which one of those two is the clue for categorization? How do we learn categorization? Uh, and so what we were asking was, what if we only do one of the two rather than both? Never give a name. What if we have a teacher who knows a different language than we, or we have many teachers with many different languages, so names don't work. The only thing we can know is, they say, you see these two things, they're the same category. You don't know what category, but they're the same category. You see these two things, they're different categories. Which one is going to tell us how to categorize the world? Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Because I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. So these categories, they're two aspects of it. One is the boundaries, and the way they're distinct from others. And the other one is the label. Right. Okay, when we talk about language and things right. like that. So now you just so, so I'm going to exactly go away from your <laughs> field of, of language. No, no, it's no, nothing no, no, to no, do no, with no, no, that's okay. Let's forget about language for a moment. And let's see what about characteristics. And we're going to see two things. And, we're, and uh, they're going to be characteristics which are similar and characteristics which are different. Okay? And the question will be, how do we categorize those two things? And other two. But we never know the name of the category. So it's just about making a distinction. Just making a distinction, a distinction if they're different categories, or a similarity if they're the same category. Sure. So which is the thing? That's the question. Okay. So I mean, for example, here you see there are uh, four objects, and obviously you know that these three belong to the same category, and this one to a different category because well, all kinds of uh, things. But in these four, it's more difficult to know which one is the outlier. It's actually this one, which is a seagull, while the others are ducks. But only more expert people would know that. Okay? But that's exactly according to language. If you were to look, you'd say, ah, the colorful one is number two, right? So I would think. That's right. And therefore, you need a supervisor who's going to come and tell you, you see these two? They're different categories. You say, ah, color matters. Ah, but you see, these two, they're in the same category. Now you begin to, or rather, these are different categories. Therefore, you learn what's important is the beat. Okay? So you can learn what are the characteristics that count by having a supervisor tell you. Because without a supervisor, you would look for the most uh, uh, obvious uh, traits rather than the most important. Okay? So uh, uh, for example, if we have three different dimensions, Okay, things can be differentiated by uh, color, uh, blue or black, uh, by a a shape, circle or square, or uh, texture, fill or, uh, um, or sprinkled. Uh, and let's say that we're going to categorize by shape. So we could tell them, well, you see this thing? It's the same category as in itself. Well, that's meaningless. Or you see these two. They are the same category. That means that the texture doesn't count. Or we could say, you see these two, they're different categories. I'm sorry. They're the same categories. And if they're the same category, that means that uh, uh, color, that means that the texture doesn't count, and the uh, color doesn't count, and therefore you know that the only thing that counts is the shape. Uh, or you can have different class uh, uh, exemplars. You can be told that this is different than that. But since they're different in all the categories, it doesn't tell you anything. Or you can say that these two are different. Well, they're different even though they're different textures. Therefore, the texture doesn't count. Or you can say that uh, these two are uh, different. And therefore, you know that uh, shape doesn't count. And, and so, sorry, I got this wrong one. I can't see the, the line right Yes, these two. Okay, uh, so they're different in <coughs> only one dimension. Therefore, you know that they're different, and therefore, uh, shape counts and shape is the only thing. Okay. So you can learn from same or from different, and it depends on the examples given. And so we created this is uh, Ruby Hammer's work from some time ago uh, in correlation with uh, Dr. Weinshaw. And he created these kind of uh, pictures of objects. Uh, or these kind, these, okay, these two are completely different. They're different in eye, in uh, color of the body, in type of tail, 
uh, and try it out with subjects, giving them clues and seeing how well they do the categorization. And it turns out that the same class exemplars, if you give them to them, then uh, they got more or less <laughs> a good response. And irrespective of whether you chose the examples randomly, or you chose those which were informative, or if you actually explained to them how they should use it. But if you use the negative, then the random ones don't give you as much information. If the, you choose the informative ones, then the subjects learn it. And if you tell them how to use them, then they do even better. Uh, and, and we tested this also with children. And we found that children uh, use same categories much better than the difference. And adults are getting to them equally. And uh, then can use the, the, the different categories even better than the same categories. Because fine differences, as we, as we saw with adults, and the seagulls find differences you can only learn by being told which ones are different. So categorization can depend on stimulus frequency. Categorization can depend on the teacher informing either when two images belong to the same category or when two images belong to different categories. OK. Is categorization useful only for differentiating among classifying images, or are images always defined in terms of their categories. And, and now I want to bring a, a, a study done by Ben and Fusey. This was something uh, published with, they really talk about the hippocampus and about clay cells and so on. But in discussions with them, uh, we came to the idea that maybe all objects are not represented by all its characteristics. We see this duck. Well, it's got this color and this beak and this and that. And we have to categorize all of that. But rather, whatever we're categorizing, whatever we're looking at, we represent that object by what category does it belong to, and therefore, what's the prototype of that category, and in what ways does it differ from its prototype. Okay? And, and the theory then says that that would be a more uh, concise uh, uh, representation. And, and it, it, this will be true because uh, two things about it. The brain will represent the, kind of the prototype in all the details and represent exemplars by the identity, the name of the prototype, plus the list of differences. And this is efficient because there, uh, there are fewer prototypes than exemplars. And therefore, you just have to represent them in their details. And there are fewer differences from the prototype because it belongs to the same category. Therefore, there are fewer differences. And uh, the theory starts with this ultrametric tree, where you have a, a few ancestors, and each ancestor has a few descendants. And you represent the ancestors in total, but the, uh, the descendants are represented only by the differences from the ancestor. Okay? So this descendant is different in this point, in this point. That's all you have to represent. So the ancestor is the prototype. The ancestor is the prototype. Rather, yes. Or what he was calling ancestor, I would call the prototype. Okay? Yes. Okay. So if that is true, uh, we should be able to learn what are the prototypes just by re looking at the exemplars. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to show a bunch of exemplars, and we're going to see if subjects, therefore, know the prototype. Okay. So this is the subject experiment which Noam Khayat did. He showed a bunch of pictures, all belonging to the same uh, category. This was category mammals, OK? Uh, and then showed two pictures. One of them had been here in this series. These were 10 pictures shown at 100 milliseconds per object and uh, 67 milliseconds uh, between them. So it's rapid, OK? They're seeing a whole bunch of things very quickly. Uh, and then you ask, which one was there? They remember some of them, but most of them they don't remember. And they, okay? and sometimes the one that was there is the prototype. And I'll define in a minute what I mean by prototype when I talk about animals. Okay? So the prototype is a typical animal. Okay? We all know that uh, mammal, uh, uh, a mammal, uh, 
uh, a whale or a uh, dolphin is not a prototypical uh, mammal. Uh, and sometimes one of the two, the new one, which was never seen here, was from a different category. So we want to see how good they do. And what happens is the following. When the one that was in the, the, the RSVP uh, sequence was the prototype, they're doing better. When neither the new or the seen were the prototype, they do average. And when the new one is the prototype, in other words, the prototype was not included, they say it was there anyway, and therefore they're getting it wrong because they're choosing the new one, and they do worse. So wait, the new was a prototype from a different category? No, from the same category. But it wasn't shown in the sequence. Ah, okay. okay. Okay? So therefore it's new, and they should not have chosen it because they did not see it, okay? Uh, you can notice that all these are better than half because they do remember some, and therefore some of them are getting right just because they remembered that picture. And when the new one was from a different category, then they know to reject that, and therefore they're choosing the one that was seen. And we call this the prototype effect, and this the category effect. So subjects, when they see a bunch of things from the same category, they, okay. Uh, and this was true for students the lab, 15 of those, or 177 uh, um, uh, uh, sorry. Amazon Turks. Okay? Uh, mechanic. You know what Amazon Mechanical Turks are? Yeah? No? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, what, what, what you can do is you ask Amazon to give you some workers, and they do the task for you, and uh, you pay them two bucks, and uh, they uh, overnight have 100 subjects. It, it, this has changed the field of psychophysics entirely. Instead of working for an hour with each one of 15 students, you get 100 just like that. It's got its problems. Half of them are drunk. What? Half of them are drunk while doing it. <laughs> they, they, they are drunk. Half of them are drunk while they yeah, do yeah. it. Well, okay, yeah, no, 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 20% went to throw out. And how do you know you can throw them back? Because they give average answers. Okay, Everything is 50%. They're not doing the test. But you know that. Okay? And you know this, uh, the easy ones are not better than the hard ones. And so on. So you, you know which ones to throw out. And, yeah. Okay. So uh, now, then we ask, well, I, mean, I said that one is a prototype. What do I mean by prototype? So I said before that basic level categories we learn uh, very quickly. We just know what is the basic level. Okay? Uh, and the same with the prototype. So what do we, we know? When I asked you the pictures, how quickly did you respond? So what we did with subjects, this is another set of subjects we did, not included in this group. And for these subjects, we said the name, apple. Then we showed them two pictures. One was an apple and one was uh, a cow. Okay? And they just have to point to the one which is the apple. And, 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 et going through that. and the question was only the response time. The ones that they do fastest are the ones closer to the prototype, and the ones that they slower are further away from the prototype. When you ask for a mammal and you show them a dolphin, it takes them a bit longer to respond. Okay. So this is, for example, food. This one was much faster than this one. Not food, obviously, everybody knows the dessert, not food. Okay, and cars, I mean, this is typical, this is not typical. Birds, a pigeon, everybody knows. Well, okay, and dogs uh, are animals, while uh, octopuses are not. Uh, clothing, and, and so on. Okay. So we use this as our measure. And then we said, when we show these two pictures, which one was closer to the prototype? In other words, which one was more typical of the category? And if they chose the, if the seen one was closer to the prototype, then they do better. And if the new one, then they're choosing the new one, therefore they're doing worse, what we call worse. Okay? And we get this nice difference between the test and This is the difference between the two in terms of how close they are to them. Okay, so, but these were categories that were learned over time. And in fact, we sent this paper to the Journal of Vision and after it was uh, seen by the reviewers and we got some comments and we answered the comments and then they accepted it, all the reviewers were fine, the editor said, no, sorry, my categorization is not vision. And therefore we rejected the paper. 
So we sent it to another journal, which is Journal of Attention, uh, Perception, and Psychophysics. And uh, the reviewer said, I've seen this paper already. I already accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. Okay. So, but still, uh, if, if these are categories which we know, yes, sir. Sure. In these experiments, do you ask the participant what they think about the prototype is? No. We never asked them. In, in fact, uh, in doing this, we're asking them what was there. We're never asking them to categorize. We're never asking them anything about that. All we're asking them is, do you remember? Do you remember having seen this picture? And it turns out that they remember seeing the picture, even though it was never there, because it's the prototype of the category. Okay. Right, I'm just curious what they classify based on. Like, what sort of features are they We never asked them. We, we never mentioned the word category. We mm -hmm. never mentioned the word prototype. Okay. It's all implicit. So far, I'm doing only implicit stuff. I will get to explicit in 10 minutes. Okay. So since these were categories which we know from a lifetime, what about new categories? Can we teach them new categories? And they'll do also the same thing, that they'll know what center is. Okay. So uh, using this idea of, of Stefano, uh, what Norm did was say, well, let's take this shape, and then that will be the ancestor. And then we'll change the shape by making it wider or narrower or uh, tilt it a bit. Okay, so each one of these is an example of a uh, ancestor and uh, 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 eight different uh, um, uh, descendants from the ancestor. Okay, and then we're going to create a lot of descendants and then show them and then ask was which one was there. They have to remember these odd shapes. It's very very difficult for them, but. Somehow, what happens is that they get what the uh, prototype is, what the ancestor is. And therefore, if one of these two is the ancestor, they're going to say that one was there. And by the distance from the ancestor is what their response is going to be. Even though this is a category which they've never seen before, they've learned only by the experiment where they had 200 milliseconds per item. But shall hear you, they were equidistant from the, the prototype. Did you have a case where you change the distance and see an effect yes, of the did. distance? We did. I think we're going to get to it. So, uh, so first of all, when uh, they're both descendants, they do about 50-50. Uh, when the uh, uh, ancestor, uh, the seen one is the ancestor, they do better. And when the new one is the ancestor, they do worse. In other words, they choose the new one instead of the seen one. And when the descendant comes from a different ancestor, then they, they can reject that one and they do best. Okay? Uh, and differences from the ancestor. Yeah, uh, so we did do what you said. And uh, even though in this case they were equidistant, but uh, we have, for example, this one is different in two uh, characteristics. So we can do it with a number of characteristics rather than just uh, one or two. And therefore, it, it's further away. So you don't have a metric. Do you have a metric for the distances? Uh, well, we will if I, uh, OK. Uh, do we have it? No, I, I, I'm not going to show it. We did a whole set of experiments doing all kinds of stars and so on, and, uh, uh, and where we had metrics of how different they were. Okay, we had stars, and then the, the distance between the things could be changed, or the extent of it. Be, so we, we did exactly that. Okay. I'm not going to show it here, but I can show you. OK. Um, OK, so till now, we've talked about categories, and we've talked about objects, and we've talked about new objects that they have never seen before. But now we say, what about going to very simple things? And therefore, it's a different field in a way. It's called ensemble perception. But for us, it's really the same thing. Because also when you see a bunch of circles of different sizes, there's a category that is being done there. It's circles, for example. Okay? Um, so, but we're, we want to see if we're going to get the same category and prototype effects when we go over to very simple stimuli. Okay. And the simple stimuli that we used were circles of different size, lines of different orientation, or disks of different brightness. 
Okay, and in every case, what we do is we show them a bunch, and then we say, which one was there? And it's very difficult to remember which one was there. Okay, there's a bunch of circles of different sizes and in random order and so on. But what they do get is what the average size is. And that average size is like the prototype of the, uh, of the uh, category. And therefore, when the seen one, the one which was actually there, uh, is the prototype, is the average, they say, yes, it's the scene. If they, the new one is the average, and the average wasn't amongst the set, then they choose the new one. And the same with the orientation, and the same with brightness. So we use the same methods, and, and we show circle size. Uh, I think we show eight of them or 10 of them. Uh, and then there's a mask afterwards <coughs> to test items. OK. And here are the results. And they look similar to what we got with the categories. In other words, when the one which was seen is equal to the mean, they say, oh, yes, that was there. If the new one is equal to the mean, they think it's the new one, and therefore they get it wrong. In between, when neither is equal, and when the new one is outside the range, in other words, we have a range of circles which go from this size to this size. If there's one like that or one like this, then they don't include it. Now, now remember, they're doing a block of trials where they're seeing circles of size. So we have circles of sizes. There are 30 different sizes which we can have. And we choose a bunch of them for this trial. So there's circles of all kinds of sizes like that. Okay? On another trial, it's going to be this one. So there's no mean on every trial. And yet, they get the mean, and they know the mean, and they respond according to the distance from the mean. Right. So they get the mean of that specific trial? Of that trial. Trouble. They get the mean of that trial. So they're learning the mean trial by trial on the fly. Okay? And therefore, we can measure the difference between the, the two, the seen and the new, the difference they are uh, from the mean. Okay. So you can have, this is the mean, and then one of them is here, one of them is there. So the difference is that. Or they can be further away, oh, but that's the same difference. Okay. Or they can be this way on the two sides, the same difference. So this is the difference in distance from the mean of the seen and the new. And one of them might be, the red here, is when the scene is equal to the mean. So only the new one is changing its sizes here. Or here, the new one is equal to the mean, and the seen one is changing. Or neither one is equal to the mean. That's the blue, and the yellow is the average of all the So we get this nice dependence on the distance from the mean. Uh, and this sometimes looks like a straight line. And if we keep going further, we, it really looks like a sigma. Right. Because when, when you get to very big differences, on one hand, when the new is, then you get to zero. And here, you get to one. So you can get a sigma coming out. OK. So conclusions. Familiar categories, novel categories, simple sets are all represented in terms of the prototype or mean. Participants remember the mean even when it was absent. These experiments tested implicit memory of the mean. We asked participants to perform a memory task to report which of two images were seen before in the RSVP sequence of images. What if we test explicit memory? So now the question is, are we going to compare implicit and explicit tests of the same thing, of knowing the mean? Okay. Okay, so here we did three. This was a complicated task. We wanted to really get a going path. So we did, again, circle size, line orientation, and this brightness. Uh, but instead of always presenting them temporally, RSVP one after the other, sometimes we showed them all together. So there should be a spatial dispersion. We gave them more time. We gave them half a second to look at them. And then we're going to do the same test of showing them one that was there and one that was not there and see if they get the meat. Or we're going to do spatio-temporal where we take, for example, uh, this is the example of uh, line orientation, where we have the lines in different positions, but shown one after the other. So we have three variables, size, orientation, brightness, three presentation types, temporal RSVP, or spatial temporal. We actually did this in, in two ways. In one way, we had these two as a test, and sometimes we had just one test. 
but I'm going to talk about only about the ones where we had the two tests, like we've done before. And this is, as we remember before, the same kind of response for size, orientation, or brightness, where when the scene is equal to the mean, they're doing better. When the new is equal to the mean, they're doing worse. When neither, or when the new one is out, they're doing worse. Okay? And this is true for temporal, spatial, temporal, and spatial, for size, orientation, and brightness. So there are nine different tests. And they all show more or less the same kind of result. There are nuances of difference. Here, there's a little bit less difference between this, etc. Et but basically, we get the same thing. So uh, the temporal, the spatial temporal, and the spatial all show the same thing. And the size, orientation, and brightness show the same thing. And this is the average of all. Okay, so we get the same pattern, irrespective of how we present or which parameter they are getting the mean, they're learning what the mean is, and they're learning what is the range, and therefore knowing what's outside the range. Okay? And uh, this I showed you a moment ago. And here they are uh, for side orientation brightness all together, uh, all the presentations, or temporal, spatial, temporal, or spatial. Okay? And, and what we're getting here is the same <laughs> dependence on the difference of the distance of the stimuli from the mean and, uh, uh, and, and their responses depend on knowing that. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Besides, uh, I'm going to go back to the stimuli. Yes. Uh, besides when they're tested between the uh, seen or new, whichever one they chose, it can be closer to the mean or further from the mean. So we can just look at each one that was chosen and say, what was the percent of time that they chose this picture uh, dependent on its distance from the mean? And that's what we see here. This is a nice Gaussian independence that when it's equal to the mean, they're doing best, they're choosing this item, not best, they're choosing this item most. And as the item becomes further and further from the mean, then they're choosing it less. Of course, it depends on what the other one was, etc. But uh, you still you get this nice Gaussian dependence on the distance. And if, if the new one was outside, they're doing even better. And there, there, there's nuances between them, but the Gaussian is there. And, and that's true for every one of these: size, orientation, or brightness. And it's true for temporal, spatial, temporal, or spatial presentation. Okay. Now, these two are related somehow because the Gaussian and the sigmoid are related, okay? One is the derivative of the other, one is the integral of the other. So we can compare these two types of uh, implicit perception. So far, we're doing only implicit perception. We can compare them by comparing the Gaussian with, and in fact, I've already shown it to you because there are here two uh, Gaussians in each case. They're so close, it's hard to see the difference between one of them is the Gaussian itself. When do we choose an item? How close it is to the mean? Or what difference between two stimuli are there, which gives us a sigmoid, and then we're going to take the derivative and get the Gaussian. Or vice versa, we can compare it with the sigmoids, take the Gaussian, and uh, find the sigmoid that's appropriate to it. So they're very close. And, and this is a check for the reasonableness of these two tests, do they test the same thing? But it's also for us the method where we're going to take the integral and the derivative to go back and forth between the sigmoid and the Gaussian. Okay. So now we're going to move to the explicit tests. For the explicit test, we ask observers to judge the mean of the step and to judge now tell us that they've seen the same series. Only this time we're going to tell them, look at these things and think about the mean. And of course, we do these tests after we did the test of the implicit. Because for the implicit, we never mention the mean. We, we never tell them to look for the mean. Now we're going to do it explicitly. Say, look at these things now. It's going to be something about the mean. Look at the mean. And then when you see these two test items, which one is closer to the mean? And the results will depend on the distance of the two test items. When the two test items are very close to each other, we're going to say the mean is here and they are here then uh, it's going to be hard for them to know which one was closer to the mean. 
But if they're very far apart, then it's going to be easy for them to say, this one was supposed to the mean and this was far from the mean. And it could, of course, be that this is the mean, one of them is close here and one of them is far there. So either side, but bigger or smaller. So the, depends, the, the results will depend on the distance of the two test times. When they're far apart, one very close to the mean, one far from the mean, it's easy. So this delta will be big. When they are similar distances to the mean, it is hard. So we're going to get a sigmoid dependence on delta. Delta is the difference of the distances of the two test items from the mean. And this is what we get, the difference of mean. In order to normalize it around zero, we um, sorry, to center it on zero, we do it minus mm -hmm. the center. And we get a nice sigmoid dependence on the distance, the difference of the distances of the two from the mean. Okay. And this is true for size orientation and brightness and the temporal spatial temporal and spatial tests. You know, we, we have a hundred uh, uh, M-term subjects. And then we tell them you're going to have to work for six sessions, OK, six different days. And uh, the first three days are implicit, and the second three days are explicit. The first three days are temporal, spatial temporal, and uh, and spatial, and the second three days again, those three. And so a lot of tests, and we ended up with 55 subjects which remained with us out of the 100. So now the central question is, are explicit and implicit the same? And I've showed you already the sigmoid of the implicit and the sigmoid of the explicit. And the explicit is a much uh, sharper uh, uh, curve, and which says that the explicit uh, is re uh, reflecting a more re precise perception of the set mean. So when they do it explicitly, they know that uh, the mean, they're trying to do the mean now, rather than just implicitly using it, and they do better. And that's true, again, for size orientation brightness and for temporal spatial, temporal and spatial. Okay. Um, now again, we have the derivative explicit sigmoid results in the Gaussian, so we can translate this sigmoid into a Gaussian, and we get the Gaussian for size, orientation, brightness, etc., and we can compare it to the implicit, and it's a narrow Gaussian. So just like we say that there's a sharper uh, sigmoid, there's also a narrow Gaussian that is derived. Okay. Uh, and that's true, once again, for all the parameters. Okay, so in summary, size, orientation, brightness, uh, the, 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 del the dependence on the di difference of the distances of the images from the mean, it's sharper for the explicit than for the implicit, and the same with the Gaussian. Okay. Thus, explicit ensemble perception is different from implicit ensemble perception. It's more precise, so it should depend on different underlying mechanisms. To test this assumption, we look at individual differences. What is individual difference? Um, you take 100 subjects, in this case it's going to be 55, but okay. Uh, you take 100 subjects and you ask them to do two tasks. One of them is to uh, categorize uh, uh, birds, and another is to uh, uh, judge the size of a circle. They have nothing to do with each other. Okay? And you're going to find that some subjects are better on this, some subjects are better on that. Okay? Because this one happens to have a brain which is better at judging birdness, and this one has a brain which is better at judging size. Okay? And they depend on different mechanisms. But if you should ask them to judge two things which are the same mechanisms underlying the brain, then you expect those who are better at this are going to be better at that. And those who are worse at this are going to be worse at that. So they, if you find a correlation between the subjects on two different tasks, then you can you can uh, guess that, therefore, if it, the same uh, correl correlated differences, then you can say that the same mechanism underlying. And if they're non-related, then uh, you can say that they um, perhaps are different mechanisms. Okay. So correlation suggests common mechanisms. Uncorrelated suggests different mechanisms. OK. And here is the result. It's very scattered, of course. But individual differences, this is performance on the implicit. This is all normalized implicit tasks and the explicit tasks. 
And we see that those subjects who are better at the implicit are also better at the explicit, on average, among stuff. That would suggest that these processes are correlated, that there's one mechanism underlying processes. Uh, and that was true for size, orientation, and brightness. Separately, the individual differences are correlated. Uh, and to check about our measure of individual differences, we wanted to see something which we expect to be correlated and something we expect not to be correlated. So one of them was, we talked about size, orientation, and brightness. Are they correlated with each other? Okay. I'm sorry. We wanted to look at the mean effect and the range effect. The mean effect depends on them implicitly seeing what the mean is. The range effect means seeing what the range is and what is outside the range or inside the range. And those two might not be correlated. And in fact, the mean effect and the range effect for size, orientation, and brightness are not correlated. So there can be different mechanisms, and this works. On the other hand, what happens if we take the first half and the second half of each trial? Uh, of each session, okay? Uh, are they correlated? This is the same test being done at both. You would expect them to be nicely correlated. And they are in a lot less noise amongst the correlations. And therefore, if we have first half versus second half, we have this correlation with the row of 85. The explicit versus implicit are less correlated, but still 55. And the range versus mean are half as much as So these measures of explicit versus implicit of individual differences tell us that there is something common between the explicit and the implicit. Okay. So here's the paradox. On the one hand, explicit ensemble perception is more precise than implicit ensemble perception, so they're different. Yet implicit and implicit ensemble perception stem from the same underlying mechanisms as we see from individual differences. We're saying they are the same. So which are they? Is this is a paradox, and what are we how are we going to solve? That's the question we're asking. Uh, by the way, I promised that we were going to finish on time because we have a course which begins here at 11 o'clock. So I'm doing my best. Okay. Because I don't really have an answer to this paradox. Okay? Or I have a partial answer. And, and the partial answer is, well, what is the difference in the test? The difference is when we tell them, look for the me. And if we tell them to look for the mean, then they're putting attention to that, to that uh, aspect of the, of, of the things. Instead of trying to remember each one, they're now trying to figure out what the mean is. And therefore, you can do better. And I would say that that uh, is because what we add is attention. And that depends on your view of attention. If attention is recruitment of new mechanisms, then we have a paradox. Why don't we see those new mechanisms when we do the individual differences? But if attention is refinement of the use of the same mechanisms, then we can say we have an enhancement of the most appropriate mechanism, pruning of less appropriate noise-introducing mechanisms, and therefore we can say there's no paradox. In other words, we solve the paradox by saying that attention is a way of using the same mechanisms better rather than using different mechanisms to and I think, oh, of course, I can't finish talking without mentioning reverse hierarchy theory, which if you have, don't know, you better read the paper. According to reverse hierarchy theory, we first perceive things at the top level and only later at the bottom. And that would say that that's where we get the basic category first, and later only the final solutions. And therefore, if we use attention, and attention is going to affect mainly the higher levels rather than the lower levels. These are mainly dominated by the input from the eye. These are very much dominated by uh, higher brain functions like attention. Therefore, it's not surprising that attention, we use the same mechanism and to use it better. OK, I'll summarize. Categorization is important. Categorization is possible without supervision based on exemplar frequency. Teaching categories can be via pairs of the same category, preferred by children, or pairs belonging to different categories required to find differences. A compressed representation of categorizable items may be by representing the category prototype and the exemplar differences from the prototype. I think
think this is a very important point and, and which has not been fully uh, discussed or, or recognized. Viewing a set of objects from the same category, observers automatically perceive and remember the prototype even if it's not included, okay? which would you would expect from if every time you see something you think about the prototype. This occurs also for novel categories. This occurs for simple sets varying in a single parameter, ensemble perception. We perceive the mean and range of sets automatically, implicitly on the flying trial by trial. Explicit mean perception is more precise than implicit mean perception. Nevertheless, explicit and implicit mean perception derived from the same underlying mechanism, a paradox that may be resolved by attention and may inform the characteristics of attention. Yeah, just one note before I, I end, and that is that even though I presented in this order, the timeline was not in this order at all, and therefore it's not true that some of the things of categories were what drove us to look at ensembles. We started with ensembles long before we thought about characterized, and, uh, but I will say that we the only lab who has made this connection between categorization and ensemble perception, and I think it's essentially important. Thank you very much, and I again thank the collaborators, uh, Mirab did work with us on what impact does one trial have on the next trial. If you get the mean here, will that affect what the mean will be on the next trial? And this paper was published recently. Uh, Stefano had mentioned. Uh, uh, Safa did work on uh, the same kind of tasks in uh, autism. Will autism be affected or will it not be affected when they're trying to do the mean or trying to do the category? Etc. Thank you very much.
Danny Kier is going to start next week. And we are going to have the last seminar of this series next Sunday. It will be given by Yossi. Yossi, raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> starting next week, Thursday, we restart the usual uh, series of uh, ESSEC seminars, Thursday afternoon, and I hope to see as many of you there as there are now in the class. Okay, so thanks everyone who attended this one, and I hope all of you will come also next week uh, for Yossi's final talk. And uh, enjoy the cake outside. <laughs> Thank you. שלי זה שלי, לא רלוונטי. הגודל של המטבעות? לא, לא, המיקום. המיקום, במרחב. עכשיו, אתה לא יודע איפה יהיה המטבע הבא, אתה שם רשת, בדרך כלל אתה לא תופס כלום. אם אתה מסתכל איפה אנשים שמים את הרשתות... באמצע. לא, זאת אומרת, לפעמים יש כאלה שם בעצם, יש כאלה שם בעצם. ההתפלגות היא לא אחידה? אתה רואה מודליטיז. אתה יודע שתגיד מיוחדס. שם את זה. אז זה גם... אז כאילו איזושהי חלוקה, חלוקה קטגורית. המודל שלי עושה את זה, לכן נראה כאילו, לכן עשיתי את זה מסוים. 
אבל אתה לא מתחיל באמצע? כאילו, אתה אומר, אתה... לא, לא, אתה דוגם, כאילו, אתה אומר, אתה דוגם, ואז אתה... כל טרייל אתה שם רשת? ואז אתה מתקן פשוט על השכיחות, איפה שמים את ה... איפה זורקים את הרשת. והיא דומה אצל האנשים, או שהיא בימודלית שונה, כל אחד יש לו משהו אחר, אבל זה משהו שהוא... אוקיי. כאילו, קודם כל זה לא כולם, אבל... עשיתי גם משהו ויטורי, שאני שומע איפה יהיה הצפי הבא, ואיזה תדר יצא. ואחד, אני חושב שהוא יהיה יותר על ה-elevation והשני על האזימון. נגיד בוויז'ואל, אני חושב שזה יהיה יותר על האוריזונטלי. תמיד היה חד ממדי. אה, זה חד ממדי תמיד. תמיד חד ממדי, אנשים עושים את זה. טוב, אני צריך להתארגן, אני יש לי שיעור עכשיו, יונתן, אבל זה משמעות. Did I finish on time? מאה אחוז, כן. אפילו לא מוקדם, בסדר גמור. לא, כי לא נעים ש... זה לא שאין פה. זה לא שאין פה, אבל כן. הם בחוץ עם הקפסה. אה, בסדר גמור.